So welcome everyone and uh, welcome Enrico. Enrico giving us a talk today. Um, uh, Enrico is a, a postdoc in his fourth year of postdoc, right? In MPA in Munich, in Laching, place we all know very well. And uh, he did his, uh, well, his master in Bologna and then the PhD in Bonn. And then after that, he moved uh, to MPA with some periods of time visiting uh, Santa Cruz and Japan, right? Indeed. Yes. So Enrico is an expert on hydro simulation, in particular radiative transfer and the first phases of galaxy formation. But also he has worked also in assembly bias and uh, other aspects of galaxy evolution. So welcome, Enrico. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction and to all of you for being here. Um, and uh, thank you for giving me the chance to present you some of the work that can been doing in the past four years. Um, that goes under the umbrella, I think. Uh, I decided to title this a first new challenge. And I'm going to tell you in a while uh, why I think this is a challenge and why I think we can tackle this challenge uh, now. Um, uh, yeah, as Sylvia said, uh, I this is the work I've been I've been doing in the in the past few years, but I kind of have a, a lot of interest, maybe maybe too many across other uh, um, topics. So I decided because I I've never been here and I don't know most of you, and I'm gonna visit for a couple of days. Just super quickly tell you what I work about, uh, what I've been working on, and if you're interested, please talk to me. Um, so my main research interests are cosmic realization, structure formation in general, and uh, numerical methods. I, I am a numerical statistics. So <clears throat> uh, let's say I, I, I investigated um, topics across a different range of scales that I put here on the vertical axis, from galaxies to cosmic wells, so not really much below the galactic scales, uh, and from low to high redshift uh, here on the horizontal scale. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, no worries. I just want to mention that, yeah, I've developed a couple of codes um, uh, to uh, make uh, simulations uh, uh, faster, more efficient, uh, or to provide services to the community. For example, something I'm working on is an open organization library, so to provide organization constraints <laughs> and model to, an easy to use way. Um, I worked yeah, on galaxy assembly bias, uh, including the effect of cosmic uh, filaments and beyond lambda CDM models. So investigating the effect on galaxies of cosmologies that are not our beloved lambda CDM one. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, my, my main interest is cosmic realization uh, from uh, the helium realization to quasar exotic model with quasar driven realization. Um, how we, you can create magnetic fields in, at the realization epoch and how this affects galaxy evolution thereafter. Uh, as well as uh, observation, more of observationally oriented approach with Lyman alpha spikes that we observe in high redshift quasar spectra, <coughs> um, and uh, 21 implication 21 centimeter detection. Um, today, I'm going to focus on something called the Tizen simulation that I developed together. Uh, we can go back to the introduction slide together with Raul Cannon and Aaron Smith uh, in the past, as I said, four years. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to briefly introduce them, but focus on what my main science interest in this uh, simulation, in this epoch, which is how we can connect the, the, the large scales of cosmic realization with the small scales of galaxy properties. Um, before jumping on, let me just tell you what you are looking at here. This is a 3D rendering from the simulation themselves. On the left-hand side, there is the um, neutral hydrogen fraction in the universe. Blue means uh, neutral gas. Red, dark red is... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, blue means uh, ionized, dark red is neutral. On the right hand side, you have the number density of ionizing photons in our simulations. So <clears throat> let me give a bit of context. Um, so this is a, a plot that you probably have seen many times. It's uh, my biased history of the universe. Biased because, as you can see, it's very focused on the high redshift part. Um, as you all know, we have recombination, uh, which by the very fact that we see the CMV, we know the universe was neutral at this time. We believe it was followed by a period uh, of uh, that we call the dark ages with no sources of radiation. Um, These dark ages came to an end when the first stars um, were formed. 
starting to put, uh, uh, input ionizing photons into the surrounding intergalactic medium. Um, the formation of these first stars and then the first galaxies uh, started to power what we call the epoch of ionization. So a period of time where the intergalactic medium was transformed from a neutral coldish gas to um, a hot ionized plasma. We now believe this was done roughly by redshift six. Um, so roughly one billion year after the beginning of the universe and thereafter, uh, there is, you know, more than 90% of the evolution of the universe with uh, structures kept forming, more and more stars were formed until Reggie 2 or 3, um, and all the way to today. Um, so what we can do today is observe this part of the history of the universe in a few different ways. Um, you probably all know uh, very well the Hubble Space Telescope gave us some of the most ex exquisite observations of the universe and was until very recently the record holder for the highest redshift galaxy known, a redshift 11.1, um, surpassed by JWST just a few months ago that is now providing a, a, a you know, game-changing view of this part of the, of the history of the universe. We have VLT that provides exquisite, exquisite quasar spectra that we can use to study in absorption um, the properties of the high redshift <coughs> intergalactic medium. Uh, and then we have, for example, ALMA that tells us again something about galaxies, but completely different uh, phase and, and, and of the gas inside galaxies. Um, there are a few more instruments, of course. Uh, I didn't have the space to put it on this slide because uh, I want to tell you what is going to happen in the next uh, few decades. And what is going to happen is that a lot of different instruments will target this initial period of the history of the universe, where the first galaxies were formed, um, as one of their main science goals. Um, I will not, again, go through all of this. Let me just pick a few examples. Um, let me start maybe from Concert and Sika Prime, similar instrument, trying to uh, do the line intensity mapping of the C2 emission line, one of the main coolant of the high ISM. ISM. Um, and this line intensity mapping, if you're not familiar with it, essentially consists in uh, essentially not trying to resolve any object in particular, but collecting all the photons coming from the structures uh, in your field of view and provide integral constraint on the properties of these galaxies. Um, another form of line intensity mapping is done by instruments like HERA and SKA. Um, they target a 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen um, at higher redshift than Concert and Sika Prime. And what they are trying to do is essentially to um, get a constraint on the evolution of the reionization. So um, in particular, SKA aims at providing a tomographic view of how the intergalactic medium was reionized. <coughs> um, Sphere X is another instrument that uh, is going to do Lyman alpha and other lines intensity mapping as well at high range. So why am I bringing this up? Because I think the amount of instruments that are or will soon be targeting the high range universe is at the same time a symptom and one of the reasons why the formation of the first galaxies um, is becoming the new frontier, both in the study of galaxy formation that of course sees in these galaxies uh, the progenitors of today's object, um, but also of cosmic ionization that is past the time where uh, we can simply consider high redshift galaxies as sources of photons. Uh, we want to understand their properties. Uh, but the fact that we are now able, or soon will be able to constrain in so many different ways these two very different phases of the universe, um, bring us to the new challenge I put in my title, which is not only explain, explaining together the properties of cosmic ionization and the properties of galaxies that we observe uh, that have to be, you know, match and be and provide a unique picture of the high redshift universe, but also their connection. <clears throat> so, what do I mean by their connection? Let me give you one example. Um, this is a redshift seven quasar spectrum. This is the very bright Lyman alpha emission line. Um, this is the continuum of the quasar itself. Uh, and you see blue water of the Lyman Alpha emission line, you have the, the well known Gunn Peterson trough. So, a region where the flux is completely absorbed by the intervening IGM, which is 
let's call it neutral, although the Lyman alpha is a, is a line with a very strong, uh, very large oscillator strength. So even a neutral fracking of 10 to the minus four is already enough to complete the absorbing coming flux. Um, and this has been used for many years as, a, as, a, as an evidence that ionization was ongoing at around Regi 6 or so. Um, but with new um, observation with higher spectral resolution, what we start to see are these small spikes, a region of transmitted flux in the high Regi universe. And because of the high oscillator strength of the Lyman alpha line, we can say confidently that these regions are regions of very high ionization. That's, these are the regions around the first sources of the ionization. Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm a simulator. So when this observation came out, what I, what I did was turn to simulations and try to understand where those uh, Lyman alpha spikes come from. <laughs> um, so essentially, I, I produced synthetic spectra from the simulations and then went and checked what are the conditions of the universe where these spikes are produced. And what you can see on the top here is a distribution of uh, you know, normalized histogram of the, the over density, temperature, and H1 fraction where these spikes were produced. And so to make a long story short, essentially these, uh, as I already told you, these spikes are produced in the first uh, highly ionized regions. So very hot, very ionized, and under dense region in the high energy units. That's not so surprising. Um, what you can do is uh, to just be sure uh, is to compute uh, how in the, front, the ratio between the, the ionization state of the gas in these regions of the universe over what you would expect, or let's say over the average ionization state of the IGF, and you find that these peaks are overly ionized. So they are close, you know, we can interpret that as being closer to the sources of ionization. They are more ionized than the average IGF. Um, if this is true, if this interpretation is, is correct, we can do another experiment. We can take a high ratio quasar spectrum, uh, in particular the Lyman alpha portion, the one I showed you before. Uh, we can identify galaxies around this uh, line of sight in some ways, um, and then compute the, the correlation uh, between the transmitted flux and the galaxies. So practically, we just take each and every pixel in the spectrum, compute its distance from each and every galaxy, and we identify around the spectrum, and we come up with a Essentially, a list of, flux, of pairs flux distance. We repeat this you know, for every pixel in the spectrum. And then we bin these pairs as a function of their distance. Um, and we end up with something like the plot here. So for now, I ask you to uh, ignore for a minute the white lines. Uh, what we get from observation are these green points. Um, what you have on the vertical axis is just a normalized version of what I told you divided by the average flux minus one, so the average is at zero. <coughs> and now let's see if we can understand it from a physical point of view. Um, so at small distances on the left of this plot, um, small distances mean that the, the impact parameter of the quasar sideline to the galaxy uh, next to it is very small. So a galaxy is very close to the line of sight from the quasar. And we get a suppression of the flux. Um, why is that? Well, we believe uh, galaxies live in over dense regions. Um, if it's an over dense region, it means the, the gas density is higher there. Therefore, the recombination rate of gas is larger than in the IGM, in the average universe. Uh, more recombination means more neutral gas and therefore more absorption. And so the Lyman alpha just doesn't go through and we have a suppression of the flux. So we interpret this drop as, a, as an effect of the over dense where galaxies live. On the right hand side, we, we have galaxies that are very far from the line of sight. So we don't expect any impact of the galaxies on the properties of on the flux along the line of sight. And indeed, we see that um, the observed flux goes back to the mean, which is this dashed line. What you can see here uh, is uh, an excess of transmitted flux at intermediate scales. How do we interpret that? Um, the best way we we, we have to interpret this is as a proximity effect. If galaxies are, as we think, the sources of reionization, the density of ionizing photons around them will be larger than in the average universe, just because we are closer to them. Um, therefore, when, uh, you know, there is a, when the galaxy is too close to the line of sight, the, over the density takes over. Um, 
when the galaxy is too far, this proximity effect of the ionizing photons is not uh, strong enough. But at intermediate distances, uh, we have that there is an excess of ionizing photons compared to the average, which overly ionize the intergalactic medium. Um, but the effect of the overdensity from the galaxy has not kicked in yet. And we uh, get this excess. So we can make sense of these observations. Now, again, I'm a simulator, so I would turn to simulation to see if we could reproduce the same. Uh, and this uh, is what I sh I'm showing here with the three white lines from three different runs of the CROC, Cosmic Organization and Computer Simulation. I'm not going into the details because they are not the main focus of this talk, but let me just mention these were at the time, three years ago, at least, and maybe even today, among the most comprehensive and advanced simulation of cosmic organization. But as you can see here, there is no trace of this excess. Um, now, I, I spent a lot of time trying to you know, study the simulation and understand why we, uh, I could not find this excess transmission, where the simulation wrongs are the observations somehow you know, wrong. Um, and I came up with a lot of different possibilities that all kind of boil down to say, the, simulate, the simulated radiation field is too homogeneous. Now, the problem is that these simulations are radiation or hydrodynamical simulations, and we need this coupling between radiation and hydro because we're looking at scales that are um, intermediate between the, the scales of galaxies where radiation transport is not that relevant, probably, um, and the scales of reionization where we can uh, decouple the radiation from the gas. So we have uh, the feedback from radiation to the gas is expected to be relevant at these scales. But the fact that these are radiation transport hydrodynamical simulations makes them ex exceptionally costly in, a, in terms of computing time. So we could sim not simply try all these options. So essentially, I hit a wall and had to go back to the drawing board, as you do when you find a problem. And one thing I realized was that um, among the large simulations, well, yeah, the large projects that attempt to simulate the galaxy population as a whole, um, I could find two separate groups. One, like the illustrious, illustrious TNG, Eagle, and many others, that were focused on the low redshift universe, meaning they um, tried to reproduce and were calibrated against the low redshift units. Uh, rightly so, because that's where we have the most and the, and the most accurate observations. But as such, they were often, well, they are missing some of the physics that we need at higher redshift, in particular radiation transport. There are, of course, attempts at um, simulating these physics um, that, however, because it's so expensive computationally, these simulations have never run past the end of colonization, typically. And indeed, there has been some, some work <clears throat> showing that if you take um, the Sphinx model in particular and try to push it past Redshift 5, in, in this work at red, to Redshift 4, uh, the properties of galaxies start to diverge from what you observe. And you, you get uh, a, a galaxies that are too much bulge dominated. So now the question we need to, how do we fix this? And so I came up with my personal shopping list for ionization simulation. So all I would like to have in a simulation of cosmic ionization. Um, of course, you need large volumes uh, because reionization is a cosmological process. Uh, rough estimate indicate at least 100 megaparsec cube as the minimum limit. For <clears throat> Um, we want to resolve the atomic cooling halos. So the smallest halos, we believe, produce a significant amount of ionizing photons. Essentially, these are the halos that have a gravitational potential strong enough to retain gas after it is heated up by the reionization. Um, radiation transport, I, of course, uh, radi uh, reionization is a radiation transport um, uh, problem. Um, Non-equilibrium thermochemistry, because at least the primordial one, because uh, radiation fronts move so quick that if, we, if you don't have um, non-equilibrium thermochemistry in your simulation, it's, it gets very hard to follow them. Um, realistic galaxy formation model, ideal at old Ratchet, for the reason I just told you. Uh, a detailed ISM physics, because that's what we observe uh, in, in, you know, we, observation tell us something you know, uh, observe lines coming from the ISM mostly. Uh, metal and dust enrichment because 
uh, not only we can observe this, but also they play a role in the evolution of galaxies. And so trying to put all this together, um, I came up together again with Raul Kahn and Aaron Smith to, with these Tizan simulations. By the way, this is the original Tizan, and I got this from an ancient Italian civilization that gave the name to our simulation. Um, and so very briefly, what, what, are the, what are the simulations, right? So we use the Arepo Moving Mesh Code, a modern code for galaxy formation. Uh, we use the illustrious TNG from galaxy formation model, which is a model that has proven to be quite successful, at least at low redshift, but reproducing many different properties of galaxies. So we just take this model and apply that high redshift. Um, we, we include self-consistently radiation transport and non-equilibrium thermochemistry. We have dust creation and destruction, again, taking a model uh, developed for the Milky Way at redshift zero and then applied at high redshift. Um, we use this fixed initial condition uh, uh, variance redu reduction technique. Uh, and then uh, we have over and putting all this together means we have a single free parameter at high redshift. Um, of course, these models have many more parameters that are fixed at low redshift, but we made the conscious explicit decision of not uh, of taking them as they are and not uh, tweaking them anymore at high redshift. Uh, the single free parameter we have is the escape fraction of four. So it's a parameter that measures how much, how many of the small scales around the, uh, the birth cloud of a star uh, we actually don't resolve. So we expect these dense structures around the birthplace of stars to absorb photons. We just don't resolve them in simulation. So we put there a number that says, okay, this is the fraction of photons that manages to escape the structures we don't, re we don't resolve. Um, and then, so if we go back to the shopping list, we can be pretty happy. The only thing that is really missing is the detailed ISM physics, because here, for, for the expert in this, we are using the Springle and Hercules 2003 um, uh, ISM model. We are now in the process of fixing this by running zoom-in simulation of individual objects taken from the parent box uh, that allow us to reach much higher resolution and therefore have a proper ISM model. But I'm not gonna talk about them yet because they are not ready, but you're, feel free to ask me later on. Um, that said, we also, the physics of, of the IRHF universe is pretty uncertain. So we run a lot of physics variation. <laughs> I just want to highlight three here, this is high and low, where we just change the way uh, photons escape from, from halos in particular. This and high means photons escape primarily from large halos. This and low, uh, photons escape primarily from low mass halos. Uh, and then Tizan SDAO, uh, well, that stands for Strong Dark Acoustic Oscillation, we replace the, the cold dark matter model with a different one to see the effect it has on reionization. Um, so finally, the mandatory simulation movie while I take a sip. What you see here on the top is a dark matter, gas, and stellar density in a slice through the simulation box. And here you see the H2 fraction, temperature, and photon density. So you see the typical bubbly reionization with small uh, reionized bubble growing more and more around the first galaxies and eventually coalescing and, and um, reionizing the entire box. So you probably have seen this multiple times already. What is special, I think, one of the special things about this is that we can zoom in on one galaxy. This is the second largest object in the simulation. Um, and then we have, a, well, yeah, we have a, uh, a detailed picture of the galaxy property. So what is uh, seen here is gas temperature. You saw the metallicity, uh, magnetic field, this is H2 fraction, and no worries, this will loop over again. So you see we can resolve this kind of spiral arms structure of these of this objects. Uh, we see we have the magnetic field, dust to metal ratio specially resolved, and gas <coughs> What we can also do, and we did, was to take these galaxies, run them through a, a detailed radiation transport code uh, for, for uh, all the different lines produced in the ISM. So we have an ISM model on top of the simulation and produce synthetic observation of what JW, of how JWST or ALMA would see, how this instrument would see this galaxy, for example. Okay, now to something more quantitative. 
Um, I told you we have one single free parameter, the escape fraction of ionizing photons. How do we fix that? We fix it by requiring the right uh, reionization history. So these are the reionization history of different uh, models. What you can focus on the red line for now. This is our main box, highest resolution, fiducial physics. And we require this to be the uh, late reionization, meaning that it's a reionization that ends by 5.4. Um, this is the favorite uh, model for reionization given the latest obs uh, observation of the Lyman Alpha forest. Um, and then uh, the other lines come from physics variation where we keep in uh, almost all cases fixed the escape, factor, the escape fraction. So this is essentially how we tweak the single parameter we have. And so now let's see the predictions. This is a plot I'm particularly proud of. This is the UV luminosity function, a different redshift. Each color is a different redshift. For different models, for now, just follow the solid line here compared to a bunch of observations. This is pre-JWST, I should say, by the way. Um, so why am I proud of this? Because this quantity is typically an input of these type of simulations because it's used to calibrate the star formation uh, model of the simulations. While in our case, because we use the elastic TNG one, is a uh, you can call it a prediction of our simulation. Uh, or if you wish, a test of the elastic TNG at higher range. And we seem to do pretty well. Uh, essentially, at all redshift, um, so maybe a redshift nine, we start to deviate a bit, but we do pretty well given the scarcity of observations. Now we do well, but there is one caveat, which is uh, shown in this plot. So here I have isolated the redshift six UV luminosity function. Um, the red line here correspond to the one, sorry, the, the, yeah, the one that you saw before. Uh, the blue line that you see here, I hope so. I see now that it's not great, but um, correspond to what we would we get using our own dust model. So I mentioned we have a dust model and dust is important for the UV luminosity function because it, that, it attenuates uh, the UV photons in the largest galaxy, so in the bottom left corner here. And you see that if we use our own dust model, we don't attenuate enough this UV luminosity function, which is an indication that we don't have enough dust in our simulation. Now, this is not particularly surprising considering that we have taken a, a dust model from calibrated on the Milky Way at redshift zero and just use it at redshift, you know, uh, six and above for all type of galaxies, uh, but it's telling us that we are missing something at least in, in our dust model. So in, in how we, we model dust in simulations. So I mentioned these plots were made before JWST. So just very quickly, how do we compare with JWST observation? This is very preliminary because it's likely all these points that come from JWST will probably change. Uh, uh, JWST is still in the process of being fully calibrated uh, and the reduction pipeline uh, uh, adjusted, but we seem to do pretty well. So this is the galaxy main sequence, so star formation rate versus stellar mass uh, at uh, five different redshift from six to 10, and we seem to go through most of the observations with the exception of this blue data point. This is stellar mass to gas metallicity relation. We seem to do a little bit uh, worse here. We are a bit, little bit high. Um, I don't have an answer yet. Uh, we are also waiting to see if these points change because these were, so I, I, if any of you is aware of this, but at some point they found a major flow in the in the in JWST high redshift uh, reduction, uh, observation reduction pipeline. Uh, these were, these observations were done before they found this flow. So at some point this will be adjusted and then we might start one. Um, so, just uh, very briefly about the IGM, I told you how we put a lot of effort and a lot of computational time on actually getting a proper IGM. Um, so you see the results of this effort here. What you see is the temperature versus over density, well, baryonic over density relation. Um, focus for now on the left column. This is our main simulation. You see this nice triangular shape here, which comes about when you have Reionization occurring at different time in different places of the universe. Uh, and um, I can go into the details more if you ask me, but this is kind of a signature of the fact that we have a inhomogeneous reionization, which is what we expect. Uh, top panel, by the way, is at redshift 10. During reionization, and at the bottom is once reionization is completed. 
If you now look at the right hand side, you see the result from the, the same initial conditions, but run with the original TNG galaxy formation model. Uh, and you see there is a very you know, sharp uh, line here, uh, a unique temperature density relation. And this is because TNG, like most of the low redshift galaxy formation simulation, use a UV background. So they just assume the ionization occurs at the same time everywhere, um, which is OK if you are interested in galaxies, but then fails you if you are looking at the high redshift intergalactic field. So all this to hopefully convince you that we can trust at least a little bit the simulation, both for what concerns the galaxies and for what concerns the IGM. Um, I have in the backup slide more, more plots about the IGM, but I don't have the time right now. So we can go back to the original reason brought me brought me to make this simulation. So look what if we can reproduce this uh, galaxy IGM correlation. Uh, and if so, if we can understand something about it and use it for something. <laughs> so uh, this is just a reminder of how we do it. We now can go into sim in the simulation, get our synthetic spectrum, these white lines here, get our synthetic galaxies. This is how JWST would see a few of them. Um, and eventually go and make the same thing. <clears throat> so I should also say I was when I did this plot uh, some months ago, I was pretty pretty scared because I put three years of my of my work into this simulation, and then I kind of procrastinated that day or two, and then eventually brought myself to do this plot. But we are doing okay. So let me guide you through this because it's uh, full. So let's start from the green points. These are the same I described you before observations from Roman Mayer in 2019. The blue points are again observations, again from Roman, uh, just the year after. And then you have all these lines that come from the simulation. So what is the difference between these different lines? Um, how we select the galaxies around the line of sight? Because if you think about it, when you do observe, observe these kind of observations, you need a way to select galaxies around your line of sight. Um, and Roman did it actually in two different ways. But they are not always, it's not always easy to translate, to understand how, what this means in simulations. Um, so let's start from these three gray lines. The, we are just selecting uh, galaxies based on the halo mass. Um, so the largest uh, galaxies produce this very noisy signal up here. And then when you put more and more galaxies, just, this gets diluted. And the excess that we see in, for the largest galaxies gets smaller and smaller. Same story if you select in stellar mass. Now I'm showing only one uh, corresponding to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And you get this purple line. And then this uh, orange line is a bit special, is when you don't actually go and look for galaxies around the line of sight, you just go and look for the, for the C4 absorption on the same spectrum, on the spectrum. And you just say, okay, wherever there is a C4 doublet absorption, there is a galaxy. And you see, we don't really get this excess. So all this to say that um, this, this um, quantity seems to be very sensitive on the properties of galaxies, and in particular, the galaxies that drive realization. So can we use this to learn something about the universe? Well, um, we can. If you look at this left-hand side plot, this is the same quantity as before, just plotted now at different redshifts. Um, and what you see is that going from redshift 5.5, the end of ionization, which is this line here, to higher and higher redshift, you get something like this and then like that. So the fact is that when you go to higher redshift, there are two things that happen. This excess here grows in amplitude, the excess <coughs> is larger, and the excess moves to smaller scales. Can we understand that physically? Yes. Um, it moves to, more, to smaller scales because we are, as I told you, this uh, uh, is essentially the proximity effect of the reionization bub <clears throat> bubbles. Um, and a higher redshift, these are just smaller, as you saw in the, in the movie. Um, so this goes to smaller scales. So why does it grow in amplitude? Uh, this is kind of a fake growth. Uh, what happens is that this quantity is normalized by the average transmissivity, so the average transmitted flux in the universe. Uh, which at higher redshift is just smaller. So for the same excess, for the same transmission inside these reionization bubbles, 
Once you normalize it by the average transmission, which decreases with redshift, means that this gets larger and larger and higher and higher redshift. So this seems like a great tool to uh, actually constrain the timing of renization because it depends strongly on, on uh, when renization ended or the stage of renization. But we can use this only if this does not depend on other quantities of high redshift galaxies of the high redshift IGM that we are not able to observe. So we could, because TSEN has all these different runs, we could test how this signal depends on the escape of ionizing photons and even on the dark matter model we use. <coughs> and once we fixed the H1 fraction in the universe, so we take away the, the depends on the different realization histories, what we get is this. So all these um, col like uh, colorful lines uh, um, correspond to different models for realization, for, for the sources and for the dark matter. And you see they all, they a little bit of variability, but they seem to all agree pretty well. So this seems to be a promising tool to actually measure the time of ionization. And this is actually something that uh, I'm currently doing with um, Kashino Daichi in Nagoya uh, and Simon Lilly that have uh, GTO time on JWST. We just got the first, well, they just got the first uh, quasar side time, should get another five by the end of the year. And then we can hopefully do this in observations. How many so, lines? Sorry. How many uh, lines of sight you have for this plot? So for this, um, there are 150 line of sight of 100 megaparsec each. Uh, and ob observationally, you, you of course you have much less. They are also usually longer. And I have some <coughs> slide I can show you on how this how this signal depends on the number of sight lines you use. Okay. Um, yeah. The last thing I want to show you is that you may have this question: Why does uh, so what did we learn about, you know, the, the croc simulation that did not work? It was the beginning of my talk. Um, I came to the conclusion that the reason is uh, to be found in this plot, which is the stellar to halo mass relation. Um, so stellar, stellar mass divided by halo mass is a function of halo mass. Again, uh, very crowded plot. Just follow the white line, which is the Tizen simulations. Uh, these red points are observations. So we seem to do decently, although we are a bit low. Um, also remember observations in this case means that we observe something that we can relate to the stellar mass and then we get the halo mass by abundance matching because we have no way of observ observing the full halo mass of those redshifts. Um, and then if you look at the green line, this is for the croc simulation I showed at the beginning. And so you can see that at you know, our low halo masses, we are kind of in agreement, but for the large galaxies, which is the one that I showed you before, drive the signal, um, there is a strong disagreement, and it seems that Tizen is doing a better job compared to the observations we have. Um, and so the reason uh, why the clock simulation couldn't reproduce and couldn't and therefore uh, get this, this quantity right um, is because somehow the uh, galaxy formation model fails at the largest uh, halo and stellar masses. Okay, this is essentially all I wanted to show you. Uh, let me just provide briefly an outlook of, you know, we have, I, I told you at the beginning, we are entering this era where we have a lot of observation of the high redshift universe, uh, a, a lot of different uh, probes. So where do I think we should go as, as, a, as a field? Um, today I focused on this IGM galaxy con uh, connection. Of course, there is a lot to improve there. Uh, <coughs> not only about this transverse proximity effect, I already spoke a lot about, but also, for example, the ELT, the extremely large telescope being built by ESO, is a very promising in, for example, spatially mapped the local ionization. Um, the or we can finally study the origins of metals, for example, uh, using uh, line intensity mapping techniques and so on. Um, and uh, essentially, if we want to do this, though, we need to improve our simulation of the IRHF universe because uh, most of the simulation were developed and designed for the low redshift studies uh, and made assumptions that are valid at low redshift but not at high redshift anymore. And so we need to actually do better uh, there. That said, I just leave here my conclusion. And the only thing I want to mention is that uh, I think Tizen and the work I've been doing with, with my collaborators is trying to bridge together, well, bridging together the fields of galaxy formation and cosmic ionization. I think is a, is a very powerful tool and for this, we are making this all the data public very soon at this website, in case any of you is interested in, in having a look. Thank you.
Thank you, Rico. Very, very interesting questions. Who wants to start? Uh, yes, a general question. So you mentioned at the beginning your wish list uh, of shopping list, or whatever you call it, uh, how to go from drop to Tizen. <laughs> what would be now your new shopping list to go from Tizen to, to the next one? Yeah, so some of it is here, I think. Um, I try to summarize this in better simulation of the IRHIP universe. So um, <clears throat> one, I think, glaring thing for me is that we have now, we have put a lot of effort uh, as a community in, in having radiation hydrodynamical simulations. Um, but we have kind of ignored the fact that now that we have radiation, we can approximate much better the cooling of the gas, which will have an, an impact on galaxies. While the photoionization itself is probably not going to do much to the galaxies because this is somehow taken into account already in, in the ISM models, in most ISM, ISM models, um, the impact of radiation on cooling will probably have an effect. But cooling and simulation is uh, done by uh, essentially interpolating a cooling table as a function of temperature and density. And this cooling table assumes a UV background, which is uh, definitely not the one that we get in simulations. So I think um, this is a, an obvious thing to do, to try to include the local, the self-consistently simulated radiation in the, in the cooling tables, for example. Um, Another thing is the effect of population three stars. So one of these uh, um, um, approximation I mentioned uh, just at the end of my talk uh, that are not valid anymore at high redshift is that we have a uniform metal enrichment coming from some population three stars that we don't even try to model. Uh, and the assumption is that by you know low redshift, so once you are at redshift uh, six or so, uh, maybe even higher at seven. Um, it doesn't matter anymore how you do the first enrichment because most of the metals will be produced by subsequent generations of stars. But J some of the JWST candidates are up to redshift 20 now, debatable if that's believable, but uh, let's say 13 or 15 is more, more realistic. Um, and at that point, the effect of differential uh, in metal enrichment from galaxies, from pop three stars, sorry, might have an effect on galaxy problems. So these are two of the way I think uh, you know to go. Of course, having an ISM model for large-scale cosmological simulation would be ideal, but I don't think we are yet at the point where we have a resolution for the, uh, large enough for for have an ISM model in large boxes. Even these firebox simulation, they are limited to twenty megaparsecs, I think, but or maybe even less, if I remember. Um, there has been some work like uh, um, uh, on having these two, uh, Weinberger uh, uh, had this, um, this paper on like a two fluid approximation of the ISM, I think, which is kind of a refinement over the Springer and Erkins 2003. Uh, I think it's still still very early phase. I don't think it has been applied to large simulation. So we'll see how it, that work. But. Uh, that's another another way to go, but maybe more for the future, not the coming years, maybe for, you know, in 10 years or so. Okay. You mentioned in your interest, you show driven reorganization, but I don't see it in your shopping list, like... AGN driven organization, right? Yes. Um, yes, uh, the reason is that, so there was that, uh, there was a model, okay, let me take a step back. There was some observation, a new observational technique to identify quasars. Um, and this group identified a lot of uh, redshift four to six faint quasars. And then uh, Piero Madao came up with a model saying, look, if this is true and we just extrapolate that to higher redshift, the evolution of the quasar luminosity function, we get enough ionizing photons to produce reionization. And so, this works, as I said, as a number counting exercise, if you count the number of photons, that works. Um, then I, but then I run simulations, and indeed it works, but then predicts, so what happens is that quasar have a very um, uh, hard spectrum, so they ionize at the same time hydrogen and helium, um, which means there is no space to have a helium to Lyman alpha forms, which, however, we observe after redshift four. So it means that hydrogen is 
fully ionized by Rachif 5.5, 6, and helium has to be neutral, at least only singly ionized down at least to Rachif 4. And this is not something you can do with quasar. So I think these together with some other work, like for example, just to uh, mention my work again, these decent simulations have also quasar uh, um, producing ionizing photons. Um, Jonathan Chardin and Maxime Trebich did also with their own simulation. We all agree that quasar should contribute way less than 1% all the way to the chip five. So I think the only way to make this quasar ionization work is to essentially say not only there are many small quasars, there are also, they also have to have a very softer spectrum than their brighter counterpart. So essentially, you're making you're transforming these quasars into galaxies. Uh, so I, I, that's why I don't think currently that realization is driven by quasar. I don't think there is much space for that. And can I make a follow up? Because I'm keen on black holes. Okay. <laughs> ask you the same question, but with kinetic feedback. So what about like jets uh, or cosmic rays? Like you have an indirect effect of mm. uh, early supermassive black holes. So on realization itself, Direct effect, I, I would say no. Um, also, for, just from a number counting perspective, there are very few massive quasars at high redshift. So they would have to, I think it's very difficult for even these you know, effects to have an impact on the ionization state. What they, of course, do is to regulate star formation, uh, which has an indirect effect on um, ionization because it just yeah modulates where and how many ionizing photons are produced. Um, for uh, cosmic rays, I've never experimented myself with that. My understanding is that they need time to build up some cosmic ray pressure in the galactic uh, uh, in the galaxy, and so they are <coughs> probably not that relevant at this high redshift. They might become relevant later on, but that's really far away from my field of expertise. So. Yeah. So I think you already mentioned one of these, but I want to have this clear. So um, is there any prediction that you can make with this simulation that then you can go test, you know, like and say, okay, so this simulation seems to go towards like the, the right, um, you know, direction or, or, you know, like any kind yeah. of... Yeah, so, um, well, I showed this uh, um, yeah, the one uh, average like, flux. Yeah. That's more a post diction in the sense that these were already out, and the, the reason why I started to develop these simulations. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, I should have some backup slide. There are, uh, yeah. Well, this is also, this is kind of a prediction slash post diction. So, this, this is the uh, effective optical depth of the IGM uh, at, in four different bins, and it's just the PDF. Um, white is TSAN, colored data set are other are observational data. So many of these came out before or at the same time as TSAN, uh, but we seem to be a, a decent job, except at the highest stretch bin, which yeah, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't fully understand yet. Uh, it, and it might well be that this data set is, is only, you know, few sources in this data set. So I would be cautious about this. Uh, this is a prediction. Uh, although we don't have the observational counterpart yet, this is the 21 centimeter power spectrum for uh, these, like from the simulation, a different redshift here. And these are the sensitivity limits of. Lofar, Hira, and SKA, either at Rachi 7, solid lines, or 8, dashed lines. So we should be able to see the low K values uh, eventually, but of course, there is a huge problem of foregrounds with the 21 centimeter. Um, yeah. And this was. Can I ask you another? Okay. Can I just, I, I just show the last one? Sorry. It's, it's, uh, it's because really this good. is actually. So um, this one case, the one case where we made a prediction, this is the. Average, uh, the mean free path of ionizing photons as a function of redshift. So this red curve plus the shaded region is the prediction from TISA. Uh, and these two points here uh, came out, were published after we run the simulation. So 
and they were like they predict this very rapid uh, evolution between the five and six that we kind of seems to get in the in the simulation. So this gives us some hope. This is not completely wrong. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you about the, the power spectrum before. That's why I, I was kind of like, like well, okay. So, because one of the things I, I was wondering at the beginning is why why you used this uh, variance suppression from from Raul, like the yeah. and pair simulation, uh, in the sense of like why would you need to reduce variance in your case, in which you have like, you know, like you're not doing in principle like statistics, you're doing just like PDFs and these other things like that. So, so is is it because you were looking for this? Kind of, you were also looking at these kind of statistics, or um, the main reason was that our box is hundred megaparsec, mm -hmm. uh, which, as I said, is just about just about enough for having some statistics, uh, you know, some to make it reliable for ionization studies. Um, so we want to get rid of any extra source of variability that might make our box. Uh, Less reliable because we we knew it was we couldn't afford a larger box although we, we wished. Um, so essentially, instead of running like the usual beauty contest where you do dark matter runs and pick the one that better matches the halo mass function, we decided to use the to just fix the power spectrum uh, in the initial conditions. And then, uh, of course, we had the twenty one centimeter in mind. And so if uh, uh, this turns out to to like if we get time and if we just, or we decide it's a, a good investment, we might run the paired uh, box of this. Okay. So um, yeah, actually as a student, I'm 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 working on uh, working with uh, uh, working on the um, to check if this paired and fix how this paired and fix approach scores with the twenty one centimeter. Uh, there was also a paper out a couple of not three weeks ago maybe uh, mm -hmm. that showed that as well. So. Um, uh, yeah, we might end up running the the, the counterpart, but yeah, we don't you. know yet. Thank you. Can I ask something? So, um, um, what do you learn about the TNG itself? So it seemed that you know, <coughs> you can't tell the parameters, the model, the subgrade as it was, and you added certain parts yeah. really that were corresponding to our ashes, right? And things seem to be working pretty fine overall, right? Yeah. Is there anything you could learn on uh, about the model itself? About the model itself. Um, yeah, I think one uh, fair conclusion is that um, TNG. Once you um, put the extra physics that it, it was missing, seems to work quite well at high redshift as well. Although, yeah, the, the the tuning of the simulation of the TNG model was done at low redshift, and I think they tuned well. They, they also try to match the star formation rate density evolution, but up to redshift four, if I remember correctly. Um, and um, yeah, so that's one thing that we have learned that it seems to work uh, at higher redshift as well, provided we put the extra physics. The other thing is we have replaced the, the cooling solver. This is kind of a technical thing, but we have replaced the, the equilibrium with the non equilibrium one. Which is not oops, is not uh, guaranteed to to give the same results. Indeed, for the realization front, it does not give the same result. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a slide here, but we we ran a test. Uh, we compared the galaxy properties um, of of um, in this in the two cases, TNG and this uh, Tizen model. And they seem to be pretty converged. So it seems that at least for the galaxies, this equilibrium versus non-equilibrium things doesn't make a big difference. Uh, contrary to some other findings, uh, like with Francis. So it might be, again, a technicality of how it is implemented. It might be resolution issues because these tests were done by Tiago Costa uh, using uh, zoom-in simulations uh, and defines an effect on the satellites. Uh, that are suppressed within, but um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So th those are two things we learned. Um, yeah, I would say that's the main the two major things we learned. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no further quests online, there are. No. Right. Okay. Then, uh, well, the first thing, Eric again. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. Friday yeah. morning. Friday morning. So we'll have time to chat. Yeah, if you want to talk to him. Also to mention that uh, Daniela Ganaragi Spinoza is also visiting. She's gonna give a, um, a seminar tomorrow in the like a, a short seminar tomorrow in the group meeting of uh, well Galaxy Evolution as to PH that we have. So we'll send later on the info on the webinar Slack channel so that all of you can come attend. It's gonna be upstairs in the meeting room. Uh, or uh, there is also Zoom uh, connection for those of you who want to connect uh, remotely. And then we'll have another talk on Friday night. So this week is a shoot test. Okay, thanks a lot, Enrico. Thank you. And uh, go in peace. <laughs> <laughs>